teachers. Today we're talking about how to teach Tarantella by Bergmuller. It sounds like this. I played a little bit more of that than I normally do because of the introduction. A uh, couple of lines there before you really get into the main body of this Tarantella. This is from Bergmuller's Opus 100. It's the same set that has many beloved pieces like the arabesque or the ballade. You know, so lots of student favorites in this collection. And today I'm looking at the Alfred edition just of this Opus 100. Um, I think there's a Shermer performance edition of this same book, but these pieces also show up regularly in intermediate student repertoire throughout those intermediate grades. Great pieces. Particularly this one is great for students who don't read as well, who are really reluctant to keep their eyes up on the book, but who would rather learn by patterns. And this piece is so highly patterned that even my most reluctant readers, I can get them to look up a little bit and then they can get those patterns quickly in their fingers and enjoy playing something that sounds much harder than it actually is. So it's a Tarantella and what is a Tarantella? Well, there are a lot of myths around this. So this is a great thing for you to talk about with your student. Supposedly, the Tarantella either came from a frenzied dance from what would happen once you were bitten by a poisonous spider or it's the dance to try to shake the poison out of you to cure the poisonous spider's bite. Have a little look around the internet and talk about that with your students because it's something that can really spark your imagination and who hasn't run away from the spider before? Most of my students have. Tarantellas are always in 6-8 time and they're always fast. So they are usually student favorites and this one is no exception. This one's in D minor, so your students do need to have some experience with D minor, and we're gonna work on our basic D minor triads. Uh, we've got the D minor tonic chord, the four chord. Um, we have a little bit of modulation throughout, so we've got some F major, C7, and F. We get this two chord frequently, so two, one, five, one. That progression comes up frequently as well. And then we do have a modulation to a D major, right in the middle. Just for one little section, and then we go back to D minor to finish off the piece. Um, that's the other reason why this piece is great for students. It's very sectioned, and it even has repeat signs at each section, so you don't even have to mark them. You can see, oh, I'm gonna play these two lines for this section and practice that for a, for a while and then move on to the next one. So it just, really falls into an easy piece to work on with your students. So besides kind of thinking about the harmony a little bit, we also have broken chords. And so I would strongly recommend that you block them. They go frequently in this from being blocked and how Bergmuller wrote it to then broken, but you can just still block those. And oh, those are the same chords. So I'm just gonna go from playing them like this to rolling with my wrist a little bit. And then later on, block through these. And then again, roll. And then jump back down to D major. We have a lot of these three note slurs, um, particularly that introduction, or the right hand. And they're just naturally very easy to play if you just do a little drop and lift because you're gonna move your hand over. Fingers three, two, one, and then take that same note with three again. Three, two, one, three, two, one, one, two, three, one, two, three. My addition suggests here finger four and I strongly recommend that. So that slur becomes a little bit longer as we've had shorter bits and then we have a longer bit to finish the section. So short. Nice rotation 
to grab that staccato high F there. Um, I also recommend rotation on these next parts. There's a lot of ledger lines here, but if your students just figure out what the intervals are, lots of six from here to here. I'm just going back and forth with my rotation from thumb to five to four to one, that kind of thing. And it almost looks like a dance. So you can ask your students, can you make your, your fingers dance a little bit more on the keys? If they're playing really close to the keys and stuck, First of all, that builds a lot of tension, but second of all, it doesn't give it the, the naturally yep, ba -dum, ba -dum, dance feel to it. Um, and then there are some two note slurs in that D major section. Down, up. And the left hand has to stay staccato there, so you might have to practice that specifically. Exaggerate the left hand lift, and then together they can lift up. So if I do that in slow motion. Same thing there. All right, then the probably the hardest technical thing in this piece comes right there, where we have these little grace note repeated notes. And so you really want to work on your student with not using the same finger. If they do three, 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 they're going to build up a lot of tension. This addition suggests three, two. And that works really well. I think you can also try the flip of that, two, three. And you just kind of pull your hand back as you do it. You could also try one, three. Might be a little bit harder on the black key. Two, three is my favorite. So mess around with it yourself. See what you like, what gives you the most oomph on the, the big note. You want it to go da-dum, da-dum, not da-dum. So. And then you just want to help your students do this quickly and easily and not make a big, huge deal about it. With all ornaments, whether it's grace notes or trills or turns, whatever, our students like to make a really big deal of it. They go, I have to play a trill when really they're just supposed to be little decorations. So when you can break it down, figure out what you're doing, figure out the fingering that works, and then let it just be this little thing that happens right before the note. It's not a big deal. All right. So the last thing I would say is that because this piece is so sectioned and some of the sections are easier than others, it can be really tempting to take a variety of tempos, have it start off really quickly with that introduction, which is kind of easy, or that first A section. <laughs> Students usually play that part really well and then get bogged down later on. It is very important to set a steady tempo and to be able to keep it regardless of which section you're in and what the technical difficulties are. So that probably means that those repeated notes I was just doing need some extra practice to feel free and like they can move. See, I even missed one of them, but you just keep going on even if you miss one. Um, it, needs, it means that the broken chords need to be rolling along really just lightly. Again, that's one hand impulse or wrist impulse as opposed to individual fingers moving so that it can move quickly. These are individual or one hand movement. It's just one drop into the keys and lift out. It's not three individual notes. That makes it more musical and it makes it much easier to play it quickly as opposed to cumbersome and slow. Um, and then work on the ending as well. This is the only time when you get a little vertinuto, so you get to go down a, a little bit in your tempo. Students sometimes freak out with the ledger lines here, but it's one pattern. So if I start at that last second ending for the last two lines of the piece, that's just the same thing repeated twice. And then we have this pattern of four sets. One, two, three, four, repeat, two, three. And that's where we get to get quieter and slower. So I'll play that up to tempo. And then 
and shock your audience with forte. I like to warm up these chords with just a little dab of pedal and right in tempo. I hope that gives you a few ideas on how to teach the Bergmuller Tarantella. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel if you haven't already. Give the like button a click and I wish you all the best in your teaching.